Hello and welcome to GB 2.0, a show that aims to raise awareness of civil rights issues, progress and setbacks from the past and present, as well as a discussion of what we hope will be realized in the future. This show, as well as a bunch of others, are a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, an educational nonprofit dedicated to the separation of government and religion. And also, I think the ACA is all about um, promoting equal rights for all and humanist charitable giving, both financial and action. Uh, And we have our usual uh, hosts, Jen Peoples over there. Hey, everybody. Hey, and Tracy Harris hey. here. And then a special guest, Sid Hall. Hello. Who is a Dr. Reverend the Third, Sid Hall. He's yeah. got all of the thingies <laughs> on his name. And uh, his – Sid is an amazing person. I've, I've known him for 15 years-ish. And uh, let me just read his bio here. He has served as the lead minister of Trinity Church of Austin since 1988 as a pastor, activist, and writer. Dr. Reverend Hall is an ordained minister in the Rio, Texas Conference of the UMC and has clergy standing in the Heart of Texas Association and the South Central Conference of the UCC. Reverend Hall has been a leader in the Reconciling Ministries Network, the movement within the UMC, for the full inclusion of LGBTQA. Uh, IA plus persons, and he served on the RMN, the Reconciling Ministries Network, National Board of Directors from 1996 to 2002. He was one of the 15 original clergy signers of, quote, in all things charity, unquote, in 1997, calling for the UMC to become fully inclusive of LGBT people. He has had the privilege of being arrested for civil disobedience with MLK's daughter and Gandhi's grandson. Damn, <laughs> props. All right. <laughs> so that's super cool. Um, lots of things about Sid. Uh, we know each other primarily, well, gosh, Darwin Day, mm-hmm. and uh, I've done lots of things in your church. Mm-hmm. His church is very welcoming and hosts a lot of atheist things. Yeah. And uh, he's a non believer, but I, I'm going to let. You and Tracy talked oh, about that. No, what is your- <laughs> I don't think there's, any need. There, there's no need to go into it. Um, uh, just to briefly, it was like Sid had, you know, has his way of looking at it, and it's a little bit different than how we accept, you know, how we define atheism in ACA. And so I just simply let him know that we had a different definition because he's going to be on one of our outreach programs yeah. today. And I just thought it would be good if he was just at least aware that we use a different definition of the term. Um, and so I think it's totally fair to just use non-believer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right on. But I think that's wonderful. I. Uh, I found that out, I think, for the first time when we were on a committee together. And I was like, wait, what? Because <laughs> he runs a church and it's right. very outside of the box. But then everything about Sid is kind of out that, outside of the box, which is wonderful. Oh, wait, no. The very first time I met you was at First Unitarian Universalist Church and you gave a sermon on the interpretation of the Bible with uh, respect to gay rights. And it was just brilliant. Um it changed a lot of things for me. It um, was just brilliant. And I came up to you afterwards and I, was, I just, wow, it was amazing. Um, hey, may, the, I, may I respond a little bit about yes, the non-believer thing? Yes. I just, the the category of believer and non-believer, atheist or um, believer, I just don't think in those terms. I think of religion as a mythological framework for um, community for working for justice, um, for um, naming history and renaming it, and um, and for um, rites of passage. And so it's not a, it is a, it's a framework to be a humanist, Mm -hmm. but it's a framework that uses myth and story and ritual. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I hope, what I hope to do is, is re, reframe it in a way that, uh, especially those who have been wounded by believers and by the church and by religion to know that there are other ways of looking at it or not. I mean, it's not for everyone, but for those who seek it, um, I want it to be one that's healing and strengthening um, of our humanness rather than diminishing. Right. So that's kind of my, where I'm coming from, right on. if that makes sense. Right on. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah. And in your um, story, you were at one point considering Converting to Judaism, mm-hmm. which oh, yeah. is a, a 
a story that is fascinating and also relates to one of the reasons why we've asked Sid to come talk to us. Uh, a month or two back, we were talking about anti-Semitism as it related to the Women's March. And uh, Godless Bitches, we went to the march and we asked people what their, why they were there and what it meant to them. And it was an overall good experience. And one of the reasons that people felt they could support it was because it was uh, run by reproductive rights organizations rather than the Women's March because lots of the Women's March organizations ducked out because of the supposed um, anti-Semitic stance within there. And uh, so I thought, ooh, Sid, he's the dude to talk to about this. So can you talk about what happened there and also, I mean, your history, there's so much where to start? Well, do you want to start with the the the, the Jewish thing? The, yes, the Jewish uh, thing. Because I can say that uh, in when, in seminary, I was taking a class on Jewish history with a rabbi who was a brilliant scholar, and um, and I just I realized that I um, I didn't I hadn't believed in a virgin birth since college, but I but I realized that I didn't believe in. Uh, sort of a zombie Jesus, a bodily resurrection, <laughs> and so uh, it was. I felt like that was a crisis. Isn't that the main thing? Yeah, right. right. So I went to the rabbi and I says, "I'm thinking about converting to Judaism," and he says, "Why?" And I said, "Well, you know, God. Uh, you know, the language of God doesn't push my buttons. It's I sort of think of it in, as Jung's collective unconscious at this point. But but it's but it's but that's that that language doesn't bother me. But the the resurrection stuff. I I don't I don't believe it literally mm -hmm. as a historical event. And he says, um, "Oh God, man, I don't believe the Exodus happened like Cecil B. DeMille, but I'm still a Jew." And I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "You know, uh, we don't know what happened back then, but um, but he says that story of liberation is my people's story, and uh, his I have relatives that were at Auschwitz, and." Um, and they didn't talk about the Russians breaking through the gate. They talked about the Egyptians being thrown into the sea. That story belongs to me and no one can take it away. He says, you need to find a way to make your story of death and resurrection work. And when you do that, you'll be where you need to be. He says, we've got just as many problems as you do. Don't convert to Judaism. <laughs> 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 and so that was like, oh, wow, this is going to be harder work than I thought. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that was kind of a... A big deal. I had been interested in anti-Semitism for a completely different reason. Uh, in high school, I'd been a, a bit of a Jesus freak, and um, and my uh, uh, my mother was Methodist, but not never rigid or or narrow on anything. Mm -hmm. She wanted us to engage all the time in discussion. I remember in in fifth grade, she says, "Are they are they teaching you about evolution in school?" And I said, "What's that?" She says, yeah, and here's is her shorthand. You know, the, we all came from monkeys. That oh was boy. her. Oh uh, well, but <laughs> yeah, you know, that's fine. Was her shorthand? You know, yeah. you know, she, you know, and I said, no, I never heard of that. And she's, she says, well, you think about it. We kind of look like them. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I guess we do. And she says, well, I hope they're teaching that because that's the right thing. <laughs> and so that was sort of an early message from my mother that that um, that school was a place to learn about science and and biology and history in a, in a uh, critical fashion, not a narrow fashion. So when I'm in high school and I'm rebelling against my liberal parents by being a Jesus freak, <laughs> she says, so what do you do at the mall? And I think she would have been relieved if I'd said, well, I'm smoking pot with my friends. But instead I said, well, I'm uh, witnessing to people, asking them if they've accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. That would and, be my perfect oh, nightmare oh, as a parent. Yeah. It was hers. <laughs> she was like terrified. It's like, what? Uh, and I said, yeah. And she said, well, what if you meet a Jew? They're already God's people. Uh -huh. And I said, well, no, not if they, if, not if they haven't accepted Christ. <laughs> and she says, you mean to tell me that you think our dear friends that are Jewish that stay in this house are going to hell because they don't believe in Jesus? I said, that's right. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, Sid, that's bullshit and you know it. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking, oh, no, now my mom's going to hell. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, so I, I was a mess. Yeah. And so, but what happened in college is I got... I began to uh, look, read the Bible critically. I took uh, uh, biblical Greek. I, I had amazing professors that, that nudged us on to think uh, through things and not just make assumptions. Mm -hmm. And before long, I began to make the connection between a theology that was uh, 
anti-Jewish or uh, supersessionist toward Judaism and um, acts of oppression toward Jews and realize that that wasn't an accident, that, that, 2000, that Hitler said, I never did anything that wasn't already enacted by the church, and that unfortunately is true, mm-hmm. and not on the scale, but those views were solidly represented in 2,000 years of Christian theology and history mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in Europe. And so, um, so for me, at a certain intersection in college, I began to be passionate about uh, naming the way not just Jews are hurting, but how Christians are hurting Jews Mm -hmm. and knowing that I was a part of that and needed to uh, move past that. Raul Hilberg, a a Jewish uh, Holocaust scholar, once said that the beginning of Christian history, it was you cannot live among us as Jews. In other words, if you convert to Mm convert to Christianity, you're fine. Mm -hmm. He says, when that didn't work, the church shortened it to you cannot live among us. And so we see ghettos and expulsions from countries, etc. He says, and when that proved ineffective, Mm -hmm. it was shortened to you cannot live. So there's a connection between theological um, misunderstanding and anti-Judaism and and the way Jews are treated Mm -hmm. in the world. And that was really my first awareness of any kind of civil rights activism, that I had a responsibility as an ally of Jews, as a non-Jew, to, to not just support them, but to look at what I'm doing that causes hurt mm. and harm mm-hmm. to them. And that was informative for everything that I did afterwards in terms of LGBTQ, in terms of the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, all those intersections uh, uh, go back to what am I doing in my privilege that I'm not aware of that's causing you harm. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the, so that's the lead in for me right. where, where that comes from. Right on. And that same thing you just explained, said harks back to what you were talking about in the previous episode where you were talking about um, it's our way or the highway. Or it, what was it you said? With uh, um, I'm sure which I'm trying to remember. I say a give, lot of things. Give my brain a second to bring it back. You were talking about a, uh, but I can think of a great example to give that, that what you just oh, said reminds the, me the the um, draft and how the people who were yeah. having a cow uh-huh. about the draft were in good hands because the people who were against it against it were the religious folks and they are very good at shutting things down that they yeah. don't want. Yeah, I had a, a really good example. We didn't get to it in the last. Um, podcast because there, you know, there wasn't time and you guys had other like things planned to talk about mm-hmm. but there was something when you were just talking about how am I hurting you with my privilege in ways that I don't know and I want to know um, I had an experience just recently where there was a thing on television they were talking about how some businesses now are going to um, not take cash they're going cashless right so they're just going to oh, do a credit card thing oh now wait boy. but here's the thing I am like the huge no cash person, right? Like so I'm like I don't I don't carry cash, I don't keep cash. I got a card with me and that's all I need. And me and and one of my friends always get into it cuz they're just like no, you always have to carry cash, right? And I'm just like, yeah, you don't you know, what do you do with it? Like when do you, I never carry cash, I never need it. Um, and so there's this kind of back and forth just between the two of us, right? Like banter. So I see this article uh, that comes on and my friend is there. And it says something about these businesses that are like, they're putting up signs saying they're not accepting cash. And I'm kind of laughing. I'm just like, see, it's coming, right? And we're teasing each other about it. And I'm all like, you know, this is great. Like, it's all going to go this way. And this is what we need. This is the progress. We're going to get rid of this cash system, this antiquated thing. And then they started to talk about people who were criticizing it. (laughs) And what they said was the people that most likely do cash transactions are people that are on the lower economic strata, yeah. disproportionately harms minorities and people that are marginalized. And pe- and I was like, instantly, this can't go forward till that gets resolved. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I still like the idea of the cashless system, mm-hmm. but that needs to be addressed before this goes forward. Uh, and that's the thing. It's like I'm in a privileged position where it's like mm-hmm. I got my card, I got my bank card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's always got, I always got money in the yeah. account. You know, I just throw a card at it. Like, and that's me not n- being aware of how my position and my privilege is have c- has a negative impact on how I look at the policy mm-hmm. 
as this really positive thing. And what was really interesting was um, a conversation that I was having recently about people were talking about liars, you know, like the, the, we had this thing, you know, the Cohen hearings brought up the concept of the yeah. liar. And if you lie, does that mean that you always lie or, mm-hmm. you know, we can never trust you? And, we, and I was like, if you lie, if you tell the, if, if what you're saying can be demonstrated by facts and reality, right? Like I can show that what you've said comports with what's actually happening, then you're telling the truth. And I don't care what your history is, right? Mm -hmm. We know by virtue of the fact that we can check what you just said, whether or not what you said was accurate. And if we can do that and it turns out that it is accurate, then I don't care how much you lie, you told the truth right then. Mm -hmm. You were honest. And with this, I was looking at it and I said, this policy is a racist policy. Mm Um, And there are some people who don't get it because what they're thinking is, well, they're not doing this to hurt people. They're not doing this to hurt minorities. And it's like, it doesn't matter. It does hurt minorities. And so the systemic. Right. And so there's some, I think there's like, um, there's two different conversations that occur. There are people who understand how the idea, if there's a policy that I put forward that does harm to minorities, that does, um, that I support if I'm supporting harm to minorities and I'm supporting harm to people that aren't white, I am supporting a racist thing. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter that the policy itself is not put in place, you know, that it wasn't put in place yeah. in order to target or harm people that are minorities or non-white. Mm-hmm. It does, mm-hmm. right? So it it promotes a racist problem it it compounds the racist problem that exists and if i support that i'm being a racist and so when somebody shows me when when somebody comes on the tv and says here's the problem with it it has these horribly you know racist like disproportionate penalties for people that aren't white if I don't back off of that, then I'm saying I want to be racist, mm-hmm. right? right? And if I don't want to be racist, then the right thing to do is to say, oh, crap, supporting this would be racist, and so I'm not supporting it, and I need to not do it. Like you say, I want to know so that I can not lend credence to a thing like that. It's not that the policy is like a bad policy. Yeah. It's that right now, if we implemented it, we would be harming people mm-hmm. that aren't white and people that are not wealthy and that's something that we have to care about. And if you don't care about it and you don't want to know that, then, yeah, you're being a racist and a classist and whatever else. Yeah. And, and I think it's a big deal for, I mean, uh, no one likes to be corrected. Um, I certainly don't. And so, but it's, it, it, will, it really bothers me when I see progressives who are who may be very out there on issues uh, be confronted by when their own um, privilege got in the way and they didn't realize, and then they then they become defensive. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I just yeah. want to say that I have not primed this person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have not discussed this yeah. issue. But it's, yeah. it's, I mean, I, years ago, I was, yeah. when I was, uh, we did a. This is early nineties. I decided, you know, I'm tired of some of these hymns. Uh, the John Lennon's Imagine is the perfect song for the end of the end of the worship service, mm-hmm. and so and I've been talking about inclusive language and <laughs> gender uh, stuff and mm-hmm. and and how we need to be aware of language as metaphor because it it's a symbol and if we if we use only masculine language for divinity or whatever we're 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 messing with messing things with the wrong in the wrong path. So anyway, after the service, um, somebody walked to me and said, "I really like said that you." And you used imagine today, but the next time um, we sing that, could you change brotherhood of man to something more inclusive? Mm-hmm. And I got defensive, and I said, "Well, you know, I mean, it's that's the song." And she went, "Really? That's what you're saying?" And so Ouch. she uh, so, the, down on the, so the, ne- the next week she brought me a bumper sticker that said "Lennon lives," and she oh. says, "I find it so interesting that you are." that you are such a feminist in your language and whatever and and when it when it comes to changing language in the bible or or christian tradition you have no problem you don't think twice about it but when i talk about john lennon you get defensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I said, well, you got to admit, it's John Lennon. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. More pushback. Yeah. I, uh, oh, my God. I, yeah. I said something. I, I made a comment um, on social media about progressive sexism. Mm. Like progressive oh, sexism. It's, it's, 
Rampant? <laughs> Rampant. Yeah. And yes. And ugly. somebody responded and was like, what is a progressive sexist? You know? And I'm like, it's somebody that self-labels as a progressive who thinks that they're for, like, all this really renovative policy that doesn't understand that they're sexist. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. this is right. hard. And that yeah. promotes sexism. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was like any time I would give an example, they were like, well, that example is sexist. And I was like, wow, this reminds me so much of what we just saw in the congressional hearings where the guy trotted out the the woman who was black right. and worked for Trump. And then thank you for showing your face. Now you can step back and see Trump's not a yes. racist. He hired this woman and somebody yeah. said, holy cow, what a sexist thing to do. And he's just like, you saying that sexist is what's sexist. And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah. my oh, God. God, please, please. Oh. Yeah. yeah. You know, and... and uh, yeah, it, it's just disturbing. And it, I think the thing that disturbs me the most is that there is so much information out there if a person wants to understand. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think, with this congressperson, I was making the point that, you know, this is a guy that could pick up a phone and say, look, I got called out for something that people said was sexist and people are freaking out. I don't know what I did wrong. And you're the professor of gender studies and you're, yeah. you're the professor at, um, you know, of ethnic and race studies at this university. I am a congressman and I would like to come in and meet with you and you can help me understand. That's yeah. Awesome. Right? Like That's why the way why wouldn't you happen. do that? You're right. a congressperson. Right. What faculty right. member is gonna say, no, I don't wanna help you understand the thing that I teach better as a legislator? Because because with right. privilege, we we never see until we till we see. Because that's that's the nature of privilege, right? Yeah. yeah. And so we don't. It it takes it takes not and like I said earlier, it takes not just uh, knowing that someone's hurting, which is where you get empathy, but knowing that what you're doing, often unconsciously, uh, often through habit, is hurting. Yeah. yeah. But and part so, of it's part but, of it's about wanting to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wanting yeah. to know. Right. I have a super small example that illustrates that perfectly. Uh, Y'all, everybody has seen the video of the turtle being pulled out of the water, the uh, some sort of uh, sea turtle, and they find something in its nose and they start pulling and it's an entire straw. And from uh, this single video, an entire movement has been born to get rid of plastic straws in restaurants. A good thing, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Just sip your drink, right? No big deal. Except there are people who need straws. They have disabilities that eating is difficult for them. The only way they can swallow is with a straw. And at the Brain Trauma Center where I'm going right now, hmm. there are such people. And uh, I have a, a dear friend who is very active in this campaign. He's like, no plastic straws ever. And I said, but wait, there are people who actually need these. Can we just you know, yeah. look at this from a couple of points of view? And he's like, mm, no. Like, Whoa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he pointed out that there are steel straws that you mm -hmm. can get. Okay, so I was talking to one of the people there. She has difficulty eating and, and drinking, and she says, yeah, I have one of those steel straws. They're a pain in the ass to keep clean. Yes. And see, when you are dealing with lear learning how to walk again, mm -hmm. learning how to talk again, Learning how to swallow again, there was a woman there who couldn't swallow at all, and she now can swallow. She's learned how to swallow. These are real and big things. And for me to have to clean a fucking steel straw because you're concerned about one pl pl more plastic straw in the trash, it's, it's absurd. Yeah. So at all levels, all things reconsider and then we could also go into anti-vaxxers but that's yeah. a whole no, a, thing on a its own. quick win for this mm -hmm. is a friend of mine um, an acquaintance that is legally deaf mm -hmm. and so she has a handicap sticker on her car it's actually dangerous for her to be wandering around a parking lot because she can't hear cars. Yeah. Right. People don't understand how much we rely on you're walking and you hear it behind you and you look and there's a car and so you right, move. Right. Or somebody honks a horn and you hear it. She can't hear. And walking around and wandering around where cars are driving is dangerous for her. Mm -hmm. So she uses the handicap so space. She's right. She, sure. she should be wandering the least amount of time as possible where there are active drivers going mm -hmm. around because they we don't know she can't hear. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. You can't see that she's deaf. Mm -hmm. So you don't know the person you're coming up behind doesn't mm -hmm. hear your your car, you're honking the horn, they don't, they're not responding and you're freaking out because, but the person's deaf. She talks about how when she does park in those spaces and people see her walking, mm. right, to the store, mm -hmm. the, the kind of abuse that she gets from people because they're just like, oh, you know, that person's not handicapped. And, and, and I know, oh God, and here I'm saying handicap, right? And that's like such an, an antiquated mm -hmm. term now and that's not like the, the, the right 
vernacular. We're all and on so the I apologize for that, no. you know. And I'm just yeah. thinking that's how that's how the stickers were called. Right. And I guess that's yeah. what got mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because we always called them that. But you know, apologies for, for the wrong terminology there. I don't <coughs> you know, I'm not trying to be insensitive. Right. But you know, she's got this this issue with the hearing and people see it and they get mad because she can walk and so they don't understand why she's parking in that space or why she should get, you know, some sort of preference. Right. Because they're just not thinking. Because because yeah. we're not deaf. Mm-hmm. Yep. So if we want to go back to the women's March. Yes. Back and the, to and that. anti-Semitism. Yes. Um, yeah. I think what we're talking about is important because when you talked to me about doing that and coming on the show, I thought, you know, um, I'm a male. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Women's March is not mine to narrate. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not a Jew, mm-hmm. and so what do I really have to contribute to this mm-hmm. conversation? So I just wanted to put that out there mm-hmm. that I that I that that's where I. That's what I brought in to this mm-hmm. conversation. Right on. Um, but I did try to read as much up on it as I could and to, to understand the dynamics of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and you've, I'm sure you all have heard, but what appears to have happened is that some of the original organizers mm-hmm. um, were uh, Jewish and felt like that um, – and got pushed back that there weren't – there wasn't enough uh, people of color representation on the – on the uh, organization of it, and so brought in some people that were uh, very um, activist and people of color, women of color. Uh, one of who turns out to be uh, a follower of Farrakhan, who uh, spews um, anti-Semitism, uh-huh. and um, and so when she, when the person of color was confronted by the Jewish person, there was there was a, a fight basically. And um, and so this is my very shorthand version of what happened. And in the end, for this year, um, the one of the original organizers, the Jewish woman, was pushed out. Hmm. And so uh, said the, and the, and and made a statement about why, hmm. and and felt like that it was that there was anti-Semitism in the organization of the women's movement, and this is where it came from. And there was a lack of understanding of how. Someone like Farrakhan's uh, hate speech uh, affects uh, Jewish women, mm-hmm. and how there was not a place for that, and so it was just a big battle, and then it sort of splintered. And so one of the articles I read, I think it was in the Washington Post, talked about how. Uh, so was the Women's March an event or a movement? It may be that it was a made event, mm-hmm. because like a lot of progressive events that try to become movements, they begin to splinter very quickly because of this, not just political correctness, but just personality differences as well as conflicts when you get down into the weeds. Mm -hmm. And this getting down into the weeds beyond being women uh, who are oppressed in society, these other intersections begin to emerge of racism and anti-Semitism and and they can – cause splintering and and that's exactly what happened. It happens over and over again. It, it happens yeah. in every yeah. it happens in every progressive movement. Mm-hmm. I've got a church member who was part of the SDS in the 60s and was a leader and she talked about how um, she she I had a whole conversation with her about splinters mm-hmm. that that happened all the time and everything from the weathermen to to uh, to the to the yippies to to everything, the, the, all these different groups that were those that were wanting to change the world by engaging the system, those who said the system sucks, we can't do anything, let's check out, let's go to a farm where we, we create our own reality. Mm-hmm. And all these things began to splinter and, and that was part of – and then there were those that were white privileged in the, in, who were activists who had no connection at all to labor – and, and yet labor was the very roots of the student movement at the beginning that that ended up getting sort of set aside because it was connected with blue collar and so there was white privilege and and economic privilege that all entered. And so it's, it is what we do, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so speaking as a non-female and as a non-Jew, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't have a tendency to point blame in a particular place. I just think that, that this is what happens uh, in systems. 
but in the big picture, I think it's necessary for those things to be become part of the narration because – yeah, it's true. You Be- can't learn if you don't. Exactly. Yeah. And so if we're going along saying, isn't the Women's March fantastic? What a, This is great. And it is. But un- until we s- we have it pointed out uh, some of the intricacies of what's going on, we can live in this naive illusion that it's all honky-dory. Yeah. When, in fact, um, we need to keep naming the problems yeah. that, that, that ultimately erode – the very cause that we're promoting right. because well, because of being unaware. Yeah, yeah, we were having this discussion on the last show about how problems don't get resolved when you don't talk about them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. Yeah. You actually have to drag this stuff out yeah. and talk about it. it. It is. And sometimes the solution to the problem is they need to get their crap together. We're going to get sponsored by somebody else this year and do the same event. <laughs> and we'll let yeah. them kind of. But they deal still with screwed up stuff. because when we that, went to interview people, we had a hard time finding anybody other than white people. Yeah. Oh, interesting. With, yeah. Huh. We, we were like, okay, well, let's get a cross-section of people's views and thoughts. And it's like white, 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 white. It was. Yeah. It was very, very yeah. huh. And that – well, and, yeah. and this gets back to your comment about uh, sort of progressive groups kind of distancing themselves from labor – and yeah. one of the things that happens with a lot of progressive groups and women's groups, it, it's kind of, uh, I would say it's a particular problem because women tend to be lower on the economic scale than men, which means they're probably working in hourly jobs, lots of retail, lots of, you know, um, hospitality industry and stuff. So during the times these events are happening, oh, they're yeah. working. Of course. Mm-hmm. Of so, course. When the meetings happen in the evenings, they're working, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. And so it's hard to draw people in from um, different, you know, educational backgrounds, different economic situations, stuff like that. When you're hosting events and meetings at times that benefit the privileged class. Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. And it, but, but it's so important to bring, to bring that, you know, there's often what happens when, when something sort of falls apart when it's been – um, a movement together, uh, people say, oh, my God, what happened? It just it was a big clusterfuck or whatever. And and what I always say is the clusterfuck was already going on yeah. underneath. Yeah. And so what you're seeing is, 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 the is, the, is, the, is the when it comes to head, but it was already there. So maybe this is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. This This may be the catalyst. For naming what's what's wrong and, mm-hmm. and, and trying to make it right, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. that I I don't see. I mean, I when when it's something I'm promoting, and that happens, I do see it as a problem. And I wish that it was. Uh, I wish that all these elements hadn't mm-hmm. surfaced. Mm-hmm. But when I'm standing a little bit on the outside, I go, oh, this is a healthy thing to happen. Mm-hmm. So I recognize that that I myself um, um, don't like conflict. Don't like don't like it when things get me- all messed up. But I do think in the big picture, this is how we learn. This is how we we teach each other empathy. This is how we recognize how our own privilege is getting in the way of, of, of maybe the very core values that we're trying to promote. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and it takes paying attention. Well, and that whole, you know, getting defensive when you're corrected on something or when someone challenges your privilege for something. Um, I, I, I've done that before. I think we've all been there, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable, and what, I, what I've found is that um, it's something I have to watch for in myself all the time. It's very easy to slip back into, like, well, I didn't intend to do that, and then I remind myself that intent is not magic. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. yeah. You know, it doesn't erase the harm. Yeah. And if I step back and take a, take a moment to listen, um, as uncomfortable as that is for me, I won't die, mm-hmm. and I may learn something. And, uh, you know, in the end, making other people feel more included is worth it. Mm-hmm. Yes. So yeah. that's just a personal lesson. Mm-hmm. I think I'm, I'm in a minority because f- for me to admit that I'm wrong is not a big deal. I think, wow. uh, I think that I, too. That's, yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. Well, wow. It's like for, I was wrong. For well, me, yeah. part of the issue it's liberating. is as many yeah. times as I have been able to have somebody show me the perspective I was missing, 
I now do not assume that I'm not missing a perspective. Yeah. 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 Right. right. So it's like right. I, right. if somebody, especially, um, you know, like on my, on my social media stuff, there, there's a group of people that, you know, I know if I see these people calling me out, they're calling me out for good mm-hmm. reason. And, and the question isn't, you know, how do I defend myself? It's what did I do? Right. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I, I've never, I mean, I've learned, you know, I can think of it, at least three, you know, specific cases where off the top of my head where I posted something and people called me out and they were like, ah, that's so racist. And I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> yeah. And I, it might have taken me a little bit to understand it, or sometimes I understood it right away, you know, once mm-hmm. they explained it. But it's just like, I, I, like you say, if you have an attitude where it's like, I don't want to promote harm to people. Then if somebody comes to you and says, hey, man, you're you're doing this thing and that's really harmful, then you're going to be the person who says, what am I doing? Don't yeah. tell me what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not, no, I'm not. Or I didn't mean it. Yeah. I didn't mean it. I, I'm not right. trying to hurt anybody, mm-hmm. you know. Get, and it's just like, don't attack the person or who's it's trying. Or you. You're yeah. being the one who's wrong. But it's like, right. it's, it's so, yeah, one. it's just so, in, I, I don't like the idea of when you point, when somebody points out that something is sexist, racist, whatever, and other people are just like, want to deny it. Mm-hmm. You know, I look yeah. at that and I'm just. Or, you're sexist for pointing that out to me. Yeah, that's what I mean, I'm talking about. Right. Yeah, you know when I when I was still want to learn. Listening to the to the whole narrative for the guy, uh, the governor of Virginia, uh, yeah. around the blackface and everything. Oh gosh. And and how he he initially reacted, I, I you know it was bizarre. It was yeah. bizarre, but but I but I think <laughs> that had he from the very beginning said, um, I'm a recovering racist. This is that's who I. How I was raised, and and I this was wrong, and yeah. and, and I apologize uh, for doing that. If he had began the narrative that way, yeah, it'd be totally it would have different. Sh- shifted everything. Yep. But instead, and it, it brought up, you know, I thought, you know, when have I? Someone said, "Have you ever used the N word?" And I said, "Oh yeah, I remember junior high." And my mom uh, said, "Come here," and I said, "What?" <laughs> she said, "Why'd you say that?" And I said, "Well, because you know, Dad said it." She said, "Well, he's an ass." Yeah. <laughs> and then she said, come here, come here. And I said, what? She says, come here. And I said, what? She takes a bar of soap and she sticks it in my mouth. And I'm, yeah. I'm like, I'm 13. She says, I don't care. Yeah. This is, yeah. this is, this, this does not happen in our house. And so I was sitting there listening to, watching this and thinking, okay, I have this past that I am not proud of, that it, that it truly is a part of my narrative. And the worst thing that could happen would be for me to, to deny that I was ever that way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's so it's not about being perfect mm-hmm. it's about owning up to yeah, yeah. to to our our struggle our past and and trying to make it right as quickly as possible yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. does that make sense yeah the the one in our house was the, the one in our house was she's pretty for a black girl oh and God. i remember huh. the <clears throat> first time I was, I just remember being in a vehicle and I had this friend that I went to school with. We had a very small black population at our university. I mean, sorry, not university, the high school that I went to. Um, But I was friends with this one girl and she was black and she was talking to us about it. And she was just, you know, kind of venting about the racism, right? And she was in a tough position because she, you know, her mother struggled to to put her in an environment where it was like a mostly affluent neighborhood, which meant she was surrounded by white kids. All her friends were, most of her friends were white. And the few kids at the school who weren't white, who were black kids at the school, kind of, it it was like she caught it from both sides, right? So she caught it from the white racists and she caught it from the black kids saying like, what do you think you're better? Mm -hmm. You know, and so she had this kind of like struggle to sort of fit in based on, on, you know, where she was in her context. And so we were sitting and she, we're driving this vehicle and she's talking about it. And she's just like, the thing I hate the most is when people tell me I'm pretty for a black girl. Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking, oh, God, that's <laughs> one I hear all the time. And, I, and like you said, <laughs> yeah. I have said that, you know, because I was yeah. taught that. Yeah. Yeah. But when I, all it took was to and, and all I could think was. I'm so glad I'm hearing this before I ever said it to yeah. her yeah. because she was real pretty, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of crap that I would have spewed because that's how it was in my home. Unconscious. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't, yeah, you're just unaware of it, right? And then, but then when I heard her say it, and I realized, like, whoa, that's not a compliment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's racist as hell. Mm-hmm. And, 
I like I say, I got the the I was fortunate enough to get to learn that without being called out for something I had actually done. Mm-hmm. But I knew, you know, in my own head, like this is a Ooh, thing that yeah. that I am guilty of, and this is something she's pointing out, and this is something I need to hear. And I just, it, it never even occurred to me to want to try to defend it. Mm-hmm. It was yeah, almost yeah, like right. instant, right. like yeah. like. I see immediately why this is insulting. I remember one time I was speaking at UT in the early 90s on anti-Semitism, and I'm giving this lecture, and, and I'm talking about, you know, things like words like Jew you down and, and some of those kinds yeah. of things that are yeah. part of our culture. And somewhere in, the, in my talk, I, I was talking about um, how all the stereotype around money and, and how it's just, you know, and, and, uh, and I said something like everybody uh, – has gypped somebody before, mm-hmm. and yeah. hand goes up. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. It's Ian Hancock, who's a professor at UT and mm-hmm. and is Roma in his history. Mm-hmm. He says, "Excuse me, uh, I'm a gypsy. Uh, that is my heritage, mm-hmm. and um, great British accent. Um, so you don't have a problem with the word gypped?" And I went. I've never thought of that. Mm-hmm. That was like the first it's, time. It's so part of your world. Yes. It's just wallpaper. Yes. Right? I, and it was just, there it was. Mm-hmm. And so, yep. and then what was great is he sent me all this, st- all these papers on that he'd written in other sources on, on the oppression of Roma uh, uh, through history and during the Holocaust and, and a, whole, a whole new world of, of empathy opened up because he confronted me in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Right. Well, I've, I still re- really appreciate that. I think part and it was embarrassing. You know, there I said that. But part of it, too, then, is being able to then go back to where you're hearing this stuff and say, hey, do you know this is a problem? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, this is right. – and being able to explain it, mm-hmm. you know, and to say, uh, you know, you all say this in the house a lot, mom and dad, and just yeah. FYI. Yeah, it's not a This is really offensive, <laughs> right. you know. Um, and, and that's because uh, it, it sort of, you know, I think those sorts of lessons shouldn't stop. Oh, no. You know what I mean? Especially when I come out of a, a background where this is okay, mm-hmm. um, the idea that I then should be aware of how pervasive this is and what a problem it is and, and how, you know, it's, it, she's not just confronted by people that like me that had it in my head. I mean, these people are saying this to her. Mm-hmm. And... <sighs> Now that I, it's almost like now that I know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I go forth and, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. let other people know. Go right. be that beacon, you know? Yes, not speaking up. That's that's the thing that's, uh, to my mind, a, re- a requirement if you're going to be an ally. You can't just let it slip. And it's hard, you know, yeah. uh, correcting my in-laws. Um, oh. You know, uh, but I do it as best I can. And you know what? They pay attention. I think it's like you. You just didn't know, yeah. and they don't want to do the hurtful thing. Um, but raising the awareness, it's it's hard. That's the hardest part is like, hello, you can't do that. Um, but yeah, and especially yeah. when it's family. Mm-hmm. It's it, it, there's a when you when you're out there holding the sign and, and with a bunch of strangers at the Capitol, mm-hmm. it's a lot of di- lot lot different energy yes, than, right. than when you're sitting at oh. Thanksgiving table and yeah. going, uh, uh, mm, "Hello." Uh. Yeah, I can't <laughs> well, a friend of mine commented yeah. once: it, "It's hard to be a yeah. prophet in your own tribe." Yes, yeah, it's, that's it well is. said. Yeah, it is. Well oh my gosh! So, uh, I appreciate all that that you said about this. It, it, helped me understand it a lot better and um, the thing that's in the news right now is the Methodist Church and their policy on LGBTQAI plus folks and you have been extraordinarily active in this I read a little bit about it in your bio for everyone but you just got back Mm -hmm. from the conference where this was decided can you talk to us about this because this is this is big well just a Quick history, if I can. Mm-hmm. The Methodist Church, United Methodist Church, is not a, uh, unlike other mainline denominations like Lutheran and Presbyterian and UCC and um, Disciples of Christ, Episcopalian, those are all American churches mm-hmm. um, principally. They may be connected to, like the Episcopalians are connected to the right. Anglican World Anglican Order, but they are a U.S. church. Right. United Methodist Church, on the other hand, is international. Mm-hmm. And so... Like all mainline denominations, it's shrinking exponentially in the United States because 
religion in America, right? Mm-hmm. And um, but growing in Africa, mm. in Russia, in the Philippines, mm. places where Methodist missionaries went a hundred years ago, with a theology that was right out of the Poisonwood Bible, and um, and 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 that is what those the folks there believe, mm-hmm. and so as the delegates and and were democratic almost modeled almost exactly from the U.S. government. And so as the delegates shrink in the United States, mm. they're rising in Africa. Mm-hmm. And so since uh, 1972, when language was inserted that was uh, anti-gay, saying um, that, it's, that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, and I'm like, you know, what, a, what in the world does that even mean? I've got so many friends that say, I don't know, I'm not practicing. I'm, I'm professional. Right? So, but yeah. but mm-hmm. that, when that statement went in and then others were added, like it's, it's you cannot conduct same-sex weddings. Clergy are not allowed to conduct same-sex weddings. You're not allowed to be ordained if you're out as, as a LGBTQ person, et cetera. Um, as, as every four years when the general conference happens, which is made up of delegates that are representative of all the regions, um, that gap keeps getting uh, further and further. And so they worked out a plan this time that they thought was going to be – that would allow for regions to and, – and local churches and pastors to operate out of their own conscience without it being dictated by the whole church. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were those who really pinned the hope that, that this is something different. It's always been uh, like when, when women were ordained for the first time in the Methodist Church it was in the 1950s. And because it's, it's, it's voted democratically and it, then it becomes law, it is um, dictated everywhere. So at the time, there was a bishop in Louisiana that said, I can ordain a woman, but there's no, no church that would take her. So uh, mm-hmm. why, why ordain? And so she challenged him. It was went to the Judicial Council, which is like the Methodist Supreme Court. They said, no, the conference has voted that women shall be ordained and appointed to churches. So you must do that as a bishop. So even in regions where it wasn't particularly feminist or open to women, he was forced to do that. And that kind of system then allowed for those things to, to come in in areas that, that wouldn't happen and otherwise. In the South, um, because the church had already made strong statements against racism, when pastors were, were being pushed by their own congregation uh, to back off from civil rights, um, the bishops were the ones that said, no, we mm-hmm. support our pastor doing this. You may not like what he says in the pulpit, but this is, this is what we've said. Mm-hmm. So there... So, this system that was proposed for this conference, it's called Special Conference, that just dealt with LGBTQ inclusion, was supposed to sort of shift it from being hierarchical, uh, top down, to being able to decide. What ended up happening was the votes came in, and they were almost the same percentage as they were three years ago of the conservatives, including the African delegates and, and, the, and the, the conservative churches in America. Uh, with a block of around 56 percent, so 56 to 44, and that's and that became um, the law. Now there's some problems with with it um, that are may not be constitutional, and so some of that may get thrown out. And, th- and that's all Methodist lingo that probably doesn't matter. The the main my main thing is is um, I've because I've been doing this and going to these conferences for. Um, thirty since nineteen ninety six, um, I have had the incredible um, privilege of knowing, getting to know so many LGBTQ people uh, nationwide, worldwide in the in the Methodist Church. They are my friends, and when I'm with them, I feel like I'm in church um, more than any other place. It is just they they are compassionate activists. Uh, people that that are working hard to to be seen and heard and valued for who they are. And so when that vote happened, um, even though I expected it because I've 
given up sort of the idea that we're really going to move past this. I just stood there and wept because I could see their faces. I, I saw yeah. I saw faces of my own church members that that really pinned their hopes on this. I saw friends that I've known, and so I just I just wept because I know that um, that policy does harm to them. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so that's where I am with it. I I my own congregation has decided um, that it it's it do, it's doing weddings even though. We're not supposed to. I could be brought up on charges. I could be. I have been brought up on charges multiple times, um, for multiple things, uh, mostly LGBTQ. But I also was brought up on heresy charges once. <clears throat> that was a really fun one. Mm-hmm. I had a. I invited a Wiccan in to oh. speak uh, on Sunday morning mm-hmm. on a on an I Act day. Austin area and religious ministries were trying to do pulpit exchanges on the anniversary of 9-11 in 2004. Mm-hmm. And so they said, Sid, no one will take the Wiccans. We've got rabbis going to Methodist churches and moms going to, to, to synagogues, but no one will take the Wiccan, will you? Mm-hmm. I said, sure. So the newspaper, an Austin American Statesman, shows up, and on the front page of the Statesman is, Wiccan leads Methodist church services. Oh, Lord. So by 9 o'clock on Monday, I was meeting with my bishop, <laughs> um, and someone filed charges from some clergy saying that this this minister is practicing heresy. So this is great. I looked I went on his website and I found pictures of the Easter egg hunt. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's engaging in <clears throat> pagan fertility rites. Oh. Uh-huh. And, Christmas and, tree and promoting out. it among Ooh. children. Oh. oh my gosh. So I uh-huh. copied some made a little say, isn't this interesting that this is where the heresy charges came from and sent it to the bishop. And mm-hmm. he called me up laughing. He says, this is the funniest thing I've ever gotten. Don't worry about the charges. Is it okay if I tell people yes. what you did? <laughs> yeah. And I said, sure, you're the bishop. Yeah. And so uh, that was the end of that heresy charge. But so I think my own congregation on, in terms of what happened in St. Louis is in a good place because they've already dis- they've already made their decision about who they are and what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. There still will be people hurting, mm-hmm. um, but but they've already decided that uh, to say um, we have different value system than this, and we are not – this this policy is not the boss of us. Uh, our values are the boss of us. And so, um, and so then people say, well, then why do you stay in? And um, why not just leave when you could? And part of it is, um, for me personally, is that I'm just stubborn as hell. Um, it's sort of like why I'm still a Christian, why I'm still mm-hmm. in the church versus becoming Unitarian or, or agnostic or whatever, which, you know, which is probably what I would be uh, if, if I took out the mythological language. Um, but part of it is that, by God, this belongs to me, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to let the fundamentalist uh, have the only claim on this. I'm, uh, so there's some of me that's stubborn that way. Mm-hmm. But I also uh, have another motivation in terms of the Methodist church. I know that there are kids growing up um, in, that, in those churches out there that identify as Methodist, whether I agree with the Methodist church or not. Um, that is their, that's their world. And I think it's important that they know that when they come to that place of identity as LGBTQ, that even if they don't know anyone else in their youth group or anyone else in their small community, they know there are people in their church out there that will back them. Mm -hmm. I had an incident happen uh, not too long ago where I got a call from a woman um, and she said, my daughter uh, has been raised in the church next door and, go, and went to school there and um, has just come out. Mm-hmm. And I've told her that she's loved and that I love her for who she is. Um, but she, she doesn't believe it because she has a theology that she learned that she says, unfortunately, I'm part of the culprit because of where I sent her to school. Um, she believes that there's something wrong with her. And can she come in and talk to you? Mm -hmm. So I sat down with this Mm 15-year-old. And the first thing she said to me was, um, 
you know, my friends make fun of your banners. Mm -hmm. And I said, I figured they did. And then she started crying. Mm -hmm. And she said, but when I saw them, I knew that if I needed to talk to someone, there was some place I could go. And I thought, okay, that's why we're staying in the Methodist Church. That's why we're right here on this corner. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, the suicide rate still among teens, the highest is among LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the, a huge percentage of homeless kids yep. are LGBTQ yep. who, have been, who have been rejected by their families or their Which, communities. You know, when I read the stories about the aftermath of the St. Louis vote, and, you know, it, it, you could, like, feel the pain of these people yes. losing their community. And that's what I thought about it. It's, like, it's just like, you know, LGBTQ kids getting kicked out of their birth families because, you know, totally being rejected by their families yes. because of who they are. And, and I, I thought, oh, this is, this is heartbreaking. It is. You know, and, and, th and there need to be those that, that say, <clears throat> we're here, we're not going away. We're going to love you, and uh, you are not defined by the system. Um, right. And um, and you may be in the system, but you're not of it. And mm -hmm. we're and we're here to remind you of that lovingly and supportively. And and we will not be silent. We will we will speak up. We will live out an alternative reality within our own local settings to model that um, other way of doing things. And that's that's where that's where my passion passion is. Is that You're killing me over here. I'm just about <laughs> to cry. I, I've known you for a long time, and I've known the good things that you do, and I'm so glad you're on the show. Um, this is just wonderful. What time is it? I think we're... 1.35. Yeah. Uh, we were going to do an hour, so it's about time for us to wrap up. Um, anybody else have any other thing they'd like to tack on? The I don't think it was a good show. Oh. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on. Thank yeah, you exactly. all for having me. This is such an uh, honor. Sid, uh, is, so one of the things I want to point out that I love is that you have your pronouns on your name tag there, oh, yeah. which is so awesome. We have them handed. We have them by the door so people can, yeah, pick them up and and uh, and it's it's uh, you know it's it's fun because uh, it not only makes it safe mm -hmm. for those that that want to shift that a little bit, yeah. but every once in a while I am. I think I know. Yeah. And I see their pronouns and go, huh, wow, I didn't realize you identified that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I love that, how it, it shakes me up. You yeah. Know? So our members wear these too, yeah. and, and I like that. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's, it, it, it's great because I, I have a lot of uh, trans and non-binary friends, and a lot of them struggle every day with people misgendering them. And, yes. it, and you know, a mistake is, you know, it's you, you make a mistake sometimes and you apologize and you right. try to do better. Yeah. But there are people who are kind of maliciously misgendering them. Yes. Yeah. And and it's like, okay, there's just no reason for that other than you're a horrible person. Right. <laughs> it's death by <laughs> a thousand cuts. Well, that's, it is. That's yeah. like what we talked about on the last episode where I was bringing up the idea that when you had the brain trauma, you said, don't ask me about it. And yeah. I didn't respond and say, oh, so I can't be considerate to you and ask you, like, how you're <laughs> right. feeling. Like, you're going to, I have to be, you know, thanks for making me be an asshole and, you know, just ignore yeah. that you have this condition. It's like, no, this is about you and what makes you comfortable, right. right? And it's like, it's no, it's just no skin off my nose to, like, respect what somebody wants. And it, you get to... You get to define yourself. I, mm -hmm. That's part of the I, I had, honor of it, right? I make these weird associations, mm -hmm. and one of the ones that I made was I have this project that, where I'm working, and we have these three different products with three different product labels. It doesn't really matter. Like It's just this is how we identify the projects, little acronyms. And I use the acronyms and send out emails letting people know we're talking about these three things, blah, blah, blah. And there was um, one individual who we we had a frustrating conversation about another thing, and it was just like it had to get clarified, and we set up another meeting, we got it resolved. But one of the things that came out of it was they apparently had some frustration that I was putting the acronyms in a particular order, and ah. they thought they should be, like, particularly ordered, which 
is really nothing to do with anything. But the point is, I'm sure no one else on any of the teams like cares what order they go mm-hmm. in. I don't care what order they go in. It bothers this person. So I reorder them. You now. do the right thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And so. guess what? It's n- it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter right. the rest of the right. team. Mm-hmm. And the person who wants them ordered a particular way now is happy. Yep. And it, 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 it's, there was no pain. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're redoing our website, and we've decided that we're going to um, list. It's typical to have the senior minister or the lead minister at the top, right? And then when you get down to the very bottom, there's the custodian and, uh-huh. and you know, the child care workers or whatever. Yeah. We've, we've decided that we're going to just put it in alphabetical order. Right on. And yeah. I, I fall somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of yeah. – it just seems like the right thing to do. Right yeah. On. So it's another symbol of trying to to interrupt the the patriarchy and the well inclusion, and the right? It's right. about inclusion yeah. and right. about egalitarianism and right. you know, like why is there a reason to rank it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I had but I had somebody say, So are you uncomfortable being the lead minister? <laughs> oh no. come on. I know <laughs> you got No, be no, no, no. Actually I do. I really just I feel like I should be the <laughs> child care worker. That's, that's, that's yeah. been my real wish all do they, along. Do they know you? I mean, I, I, yeah, really I just, love I get, what you do. I get weird things from yeah, here and there. Yeah, yeah. Usually not, not from people within the community, but right. people that are sort of on the yeah. outside looking in a little bit yeah. going, yeah. who are you and why are you so weird? Well, and you can always, there's, <laughs> no, there's this like, there's almost a smell to the distinction between a person who's like, why do y'all order it this way? Versus, so what's the problem with like ordering it? You know, mm-hmm. the, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like why do you why do you have this chip on your shoulder? Yeah. Why why is this such an issue for you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like just let it be what it is. Like yeah. don't, don't get all bent about you know somebody broke tradition. Holy cow! <laughs> yeah, and an unimportant yeah. one. It's a tradition that you know should it have it unless, hadn't been questioned or unless it's changing John Lennon's lyrics. But yeah. you know, besides that, right, you know. right. Yeah. Oh yeah, there was that. <laughs> But, I mean, if the tradition causes harm, you know, then you, right. you change yeah. it up it, right. yeah, anyway, yeah. And whether you perceive it or not, like the order of the acronyms and yeah. so forth. Thank you so much, oh, Sid, as always. a pleasure. Yeah, very so much. So great to hang out with you. And thank you, Tracy sure. and Jen, so much. This was just a great show. Um, thank you to the guys on the other side of the wall Woo! over there, Phil and Mark. As far as I know, those yeah. are the guys. And thanks for watching. I want to leave you with one final thought. We don't ha- need a savior. We've got each other. It's all we've ever had and all we'll ever need. Bye. Awesome.